They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus prayed that we might be unified in his truth, standing firm in the faith and strong in his word. In a world questioning the credibility of God's word, Christ's prayer is for his church to stand firm in unity and his word. This is The Answers Conversation, and I'm your host, Steve Ham. We'll be answering the skeptical questions of our time, standing firm on the authority of God's word, and rejoicing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we're back this week with Tim Chafee, and we're still talking about supposed Bible contradictions, because we know there are none. There there are no Bible contradictions, and uh, that's what we're defending uh, today. So welcome again, Tim. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so we need to be talking about uh, context. Let's start back up there again and have a chat about why context is important, how, how it's one of the main things, actually, that uh, the supposed Bible contradictions, you know, bring to light. Oh, exactly. Well, without the context, you can make the Bible say just about anything you want. Uh, I gave the example in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 where it says there is no God, but of course, if the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But, uh, you know, maybe you've heard the the story that some pastors have told about the man who was so distraught that he thought about ending his life. And mm-hmm. and so he thought, well, you know, my neighbor, he he's a Christian and he's always got joy. Maybe there's something there. Maybe, maybe it's that Bible that he carries around. So he pulled a dusty Bible off the shelf and thought, I'm just going to open it up and read, you know, wherever it is. So he, he opens it up and he points to it and says, Judas went and hanged himself. And, he, you know, here's this guy who's distraught. He's like, oh, that's not good. Uh, uh, maybe best two out of three. And so he closes it, opens it back up. Uh, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Yeah. And then he thinks, oh, how about three out of five? And he closes it, opens it back up. And uh, Jesus said, what you must do, do quickly. And so if you if you yank the verses out of context, you can make the Bible say, go and hang yourself and do it quickly. But, of course, that's not what Scripture is teaching. Yeah, there's a good uh, reason right there to read Scripture carefully. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So um, context is, uh, is the big issue, and we've talked about the Bible being guilty and you know, until proven to be innocent. And that was what the, the critics really mm-hmm. were doing as well. And, uh, and so we, we've, we've gone through a number of those things. Tell me, um, how do you think that the critics really fail to interpret passages properly? And, and, and then they claim that a contradiction exists. So um, you've talked about, uh, for instance, Revelation 7.1, the four corners of the earth. Tell, talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so often the, the so-called contradiction comes as a result of our failure to properly interpret. So the example you gave, Revelation 7.1, um, after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Is John telling us here in Revelation that the earth is just flat and has four corners, or does that simply refer to the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west? And, mm. you know, the Bible does use figurative language, and that's obviously what's going on here. The, the Bible consistently teaches a round earth. Um, Isaiah forty twenty two talks about how God sits above the circle of the earth, and even uh, during biblical times, people knew the earth was round. It's really a misnomer to say that that people used to think the earth was flat and that kind of thing. So we have, we have good articles on our website dealing with that issue as well. Yeah. And and not only that, but sometimes the Bible doesn't always give us the full story mm-hmm. uh, about things. So we get we get what we need. We get all everything that we need. And I was talking about the clarity and perspicuity of, of, of Scripture last week. But, you know, critics have used this against the trustworthiness of the Bible. Yeah, they certainly have. Uh, in many ways, a lot of times they, they assume that a partial report – uh, is a false report. You know, if you get if mm. you have different details in in the Gospels, where maybe you're told a little bit of one thing here and a little bit of there, they 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 say, well, there's a contradiction. For example, what did the um the the sign that was above Jesus's head on the cross? What did that say? Well, if you look at the different Gospels, Matthew says this is the King of the Jews. Mark says the King of the Jews. Luke says this is the King of the Jews. John says Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Which one's right? Mm. Some people say, well, it pretty much means the same thing. Well, yeah, they're they're all very similar. But we have to remember that this sign was written in three different languages as well. And so when you put those together, maybe what you're getting from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are translations of those. Or 
maybe when you put them all together, maybe the sign on the cross actually said, and it would be helpful if you could see the slide that I use here, if you put all those together, it actually reads, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Mm. And each of the gospel writers are just grabbing a grabbing snippet of that. the part of it. But look, related to that, you know, there there are critics that will say, oh, but John says this and Mark says this and Matthew says this and they can't even get their stories straight. Right, and that's actually one of the um, one of the hallmarks that what you're reading there is eyewitness testimony because let, let's – Face it, if you were on a jury trial and you were, you were part of the jury and you had four witnesses come forward claiming to be eyewitnesses and they used the exact same words in the exact same order, they told the exact same story, would you believe them? Mm. Of course not, because we know that they've been coached and they got together yeah. and said, here's what we're going to say. But yeah. with what you have from the gospel accounts is you have different perspectives on the same event. Right. And sometimes they provide different details. And even at first glance, sometimes they might even not seem to fit together very well, but when you dig deeper, you see that they mesh perfectly, which, again, that, that's a hallmark. What you're reading is eyewitness testimony. Okay. Um, can, can you give us an example of, you know, one of those things that have been used in saying, saying that there's, there's uh, you know, not getting their story straight? Uh, well, the sign on the cross would be one of them. How about um, the, with uh, Judas? Mm -hmm. um, th that's a good one. Um, what happened to Judas after he betrayed Jesus? Well, it tells us in Matthew 27, 5 that, that he went and threw down the piece of silver in the temple and then departed and went and hanged himself. But in the book of Acts, chapter 1, written by Luke, it says that Judas purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. You know, it's a little bit gruesome there. But so how did he die? Did he hang himself and, and or did he fall headlong and and burst open, or I think the King James says burst asunder. Yep. Um, or, and what happened to the money? Did he throw it down in the temple, or did he actually buy the field? And so here we have what critics would say are two contradictions. But when you put it together, you see that it makes perfect sense. The money was thrown down in the temple, just like Matthew says, but it tells us that they couldn't use that money you know, in the temple treasury is blood right. money, and so they used right. it to buy the potter's field, which, by the way, fulfills prophecy from the book of Zechariah. Yes. And... So how did Judas die? Well, it tells us that he hanged himself. Luke doesn't tell us in the book of Acts that that's how he died. It says that he fell and burst open. So maybe after he was hanging there for some time, mm -hmm. whether the branch broke, the knot slipped, or somebody cut the rope when he to cut him down, yep. the body may have been bloated, and that's what happened. So that it, it fits together perfectly, even though at first glance it seems to be problematic. Yeah. Do critics also try to accuse... Uh, the, the biblical writers of, of sugarcoating things in relation to biblical truth? Well, yeah, some critics will do that. And uh, the fact of the matter is the Bible doesn't always approve of everything that it's telling you about. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, we read about David and his affair with Bathsheba and uh, then what happened as a result of that, you know, where he conspires to have her husband murdered. And um, so... It tells us the faults of its heroes, which is really another hallmark that what you're reading is authentic, is is actual history. But um, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat those things, and it doesn't always tell us that what happened here was the right thing. It doesn't say that that you know David's adultery is good, right? And it doesn't say when when Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Hey, good job, Solomon. Yeah. No, in fact, the very next few verses tell us about how they led him into the worship of false gods. So just because it reports it accurately doesn't mean that it's saying here's the model that you're supposed to follow, or when the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. Mm. That was obviously a lie, but it reports it accurately. Okay. Well, I want to go back to inerrancy for a moment because we did talk about that in the last session and uh, it is related here. And, and I want to understand more about this doctrine because that's what's under attack, right? Inerrancy is under attack and it applies to actually the the, the original manuscripts, but not necessarily the, the, the copies and translations we've got today. Yeah, that's exactly right. One of the real good examples of this is in 1 Samuel 13, 1. And if you look at different Bible translations, what did the original say in 1 Samuel 13, 1? If you have the King James and New King James, it says something like this, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years, dot, 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 he, he went on and did this. If you look at the New American Standard, some of the other uh, newer translations, it'll say Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 42 years over Israel. 30 and 42 is a lot different than 1 and 2. Mm. So what did the original say? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the, the ESV uh, before its update in 2007, it, it said this, Saul was dot, dot, dot years old and when he began to reign, and he reigned dot, dot, dot in two years over Israel. So what did the original say there? 
And what happened is we don't have very strong manuscript evidence for the number that was there. It looked like a number might have dropped out. Right. And so what people have done is is try to figure out which one makes the most sense here. It's not because they're trying to undermine the deity of Christ or because they're trying, you know, that they're trying to attack scripture. The translators yeah. are trying to do the best they can with what there's, they there's have. There's not a malicious intent. No, not at all. Mm. And uh, since 2007, the ESV and its update has, has gone with what the King James, the new King James has said. They've updated it to to go with that because they felt the uh, evidence for that was stronger. But okay. it just shows, it's a good example of, it's the originals that are inerrant. Do we know exactly what that number was? I'm not confident in saying that, yes, I know no matter what, what it was. Um, but I'm confident that when it was inspired to be written down, it, it was, was correct. A, it was correct. It was 100% accurate. And uh, it, it impacts zero biblical doctrines. Mm. We, we really do need to have confidence in the, the, the biblical author. Um, and I, and I, I just want, and I want to elaborate a little bit more on that. You've, uh, you've shared with me some verses around Proverbs three and, and Psalms 118 and just, just give us a, a little bit more information about that confidence. Yeah, that's really the number one principle for dealing with these so-called contradictions, have complete confidence and trust in the author since ultimately the author of scripture is God. Right. And since he cannot lie, it must be true. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Uh, Psalm one eighteen eight: it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. But that doesn't mean that we just check our brain at the door. You know, that, that's one of those phrases that you'll hear from time to time. And uh, some people will say, you know, you guys who who study the Bible so much, it, it doesn't matter about all these so-called contradictions and everything. Who cares about that? Just trust in Jesus. Well, it does matter if you look at how these things are being used to discredit Scripture, to undermine the faith that people have. Uh, so it is important for us to go into this. And I've had one person say to me before, well, you apologists, you know, if, if, if you prove everything in the Bible, then where's the room for faith? It shows that they have a complete misunderstanding of what faith is. Hebrews yeah. eleven one defines it for us. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, or some Bibles will say the evidence of things not seen. Amen. That's kind of a strange word to have in a definition of faith, isn't it? Mm. You know, if it's just this blind leap in the dark yeah. like people think, that's not at all what biblical faith is. I mean, the nature of answers in Genesis is helping people to really understand that. We can really um, see that the Bible is, is, is true by a, a, a reasoned, uh, approach to what we see in the world as it as it confirms the the scriptural um, text. Oh, exactly. We we say let's start from scripture because it's the word of God, right? And it will make sense of the world around us, and we see that time and time again. That's exactly the case. Okay, but we can't understand it all. Is it okay to have that in your mind when you're thinking about um, the supposed contradictions and answering? Is it okay to 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 have you know, well, we won't be able to understand everything. It might be for you, but not for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's actually, that's another important thing is to realize that you're not going to understand every part of the Bible. He's God, we're not. Uh, the Bible even tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord. God enjoys hiding some things from us, and there, there are certain things that we're not going to understand every detail. Um, so there might be a day where we just say, God, I don't understand this, but I know that you do. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us. And, um, you know, if we could understand everything in Scripture, we would be God, and we're not. So, we are not. Uh, yeah, we would be omniscient. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is only one who is. Tim, thank you for being with us. Is there a last say that you want to have on uh, this subject? I would just uh, remind everybody that you can trust Scripture from beginning to end, and when when you come across these contradictions so often, be aware that people want to attack Scripture. They're trying to find ways to undermine it. And most often, they're not quoting things accurately or they're pulling out of the context. And you really got to be careful to look up what Scripture says. Thank you for being with us. And if you want to read more about that, Demolishing Supposed Bible Contradictions, uh, it's a two-volume series and you can get it on our website. Thanks, Tim. If you want answers on this or any other subject, visit AnswersInGenesis.org. That's AnswersInGenesis.org. 